welcome to today's webinar, Hacking Acromasia, the keystone bacteria critical to gut health and longevity with insights from GI Map, brought to you by Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory and presented by Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. Dr. Tom Fabian from Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory will also be joining Dr. Fitzgerald for the webinar. To get started, I'd like to introduce Dr. Fitzgerald. Dr. Fitzgerald is actively engaged in clinical research on epigenetics and longevity using diet and lifestyle intervention developed in her research and practice. She has published two clinical studies on the potential bio-age reversing effects of an eight-week DNA methylation supportive diet and lifestyle in middle-aged men and women in the journal Aging. Dr. Fitzgerald is on the faculty at IFM, is an IFM certified practitioner, and lectures globally on functional medicine, longevity, and epigenetics to practitioners and consumers. She maintains an award-nominated podcast series, New Frontiers in Functional Medicine, and an active blog on her website, drkarafitzgerald.com. Her clinical practice, the New Frontiers Functional Medicine and Nutrition Clinic, is located in Newtown, Connecticut. Thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. It's great to be here. Of course, it's always great to hang out with the uh, the team at Diagnostic Solutions, um, and especially Dr. Tom Fabian. So let me introduce my good friend. You already know him, <laughs> but let me tell you a little bit about him. Tom Fabian, of course, is a leading expert on the role of the microbiome in health, immune system, uh, chronic disease, and aging. As a translational scientist, his primary focus is on the clinical application of the microbiome, uh, specifically looking through a integrative and functional lens. He's a consultant and science advisor with Diagnostic Solutions. He's also on the scientific advisory board at Designs for Health. Tom, I'm really glad that you were able to join me today so we can drill down yet again into all things acromancia. I am as well, it's great to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, yeah, me too. Acromancia was characterized, Tom, I think in 2004, and right, and, and the name, the Ackerman was a really highly regarded microbiologist who I think has since passed, but he was given the, you know, the strain was named after him, and it's a really pretty extraordinary keystone strain. Anybody who's following, uh, it was on my platform at all at any time or, or listening to Tom and I talk or, or Tom and his work uh, elsewhere knows that this is an incredibly important player. And the reason it's got this meteoric rise in publications is um, twofold, I think, because technology caught up with it. Like we can actually measure it now and see where it is in the gut and what it's doing and, you know, how far it's got its little bacterial tentacles uh, engaged in so many uh, system-wide processes. So we can actually measure it. You know, we've got the sophisticated laboratory technology now. Uh, and, you know, we can study it clinically. So there's just this extraordinary rise in publications. I, back in 2000, I think I became aware of Acromancia as an important player, uh, maybe 2006, 7, 8 or so, when I was at a clinical lab that many people from DSL were a part of as well. And we uh, started to do, we were actually the first clinical lab to offer a DNA stool analysis. And this enabled us to begin to think about all of these extraordinary anaerobes, acromancia being one of them. Mechanism of action. We know, I think, we appreciate the ac acromancia's involvement in barrier, but Tom, I just wanna, I wanna lean on you to kind of throw out you know, why we call it a keystone. Absolutely, yeah. So the definition of keystone has to do with its relative importance in the ecosystem. So as you just kind of saw visually, all this information has been coming out in the last really just 10 years or so. It was discovered 20 years ago, and then that was kind of a trickle of research, and then it's just exploded in the last 10 years. Um, and kind of cumulatively from all this research, we know that acromancia uh, lives in the mucus layer, particularly in the colon. So it's especially important for the colon ecosystem. And there's actually two mucus layers. So it lives in what's called the outer mucus layer. And that's where a number of other bacteria live as well, such as uh, particularly Bacteroidetes, one of the major groups uh, in the microbiome. Some of the Firmicutes and some of the other important bacteria, Bifidobacterium is another example. Uh, so these all live in close proximity 
to the intestinal barrier. And acromantia, because it breaks down mucus proteins, partly for its own food source. Uh, so mucus basically is composed of sugars, a variety of different types of sugars. It has a protein core, so that can supply amino acids. Uh, and even sulfate is released uh, because many of the mucins are sulfated um, and that supports other types of bacteria. So you get this full range of kind of nutritional products that it releases when it breaks down these mucins, the mucin proteins. And that essentially supports the rest of the ecosystem, uh, which is really important when, especially like between meals, overnight, when you're fasting, uh, and there isn't the influx of nutrients coming in from the diet, your microbiome needs to thrive on nutrients still. Um, and that's provided by mucus and shared primarily through acromantia. So again, the, the whole concept of keystone species is just so important. Uh, because it has so many effects in supporting the ecosystem. And as we're going to learn from uh, additional um, topics that we're going to cover today, that uh, it also pertains to so many aspects of human health as well. Yeah, I just want to I just want to point out and that, you know, we can look at this slide and just see some of the uh, metabolites that Tom alluded to. So it makes, it, it's able to make butyrate. We know butyrate, the famous short chain fatty acid that's also essential for gut health, but it also makes acetate, propionate, which the eco niche, so the other players living close by can grab and turn into butyrate. It's producing, as you mentioned, these oligosaccharides that then can be acted upon by the bacteria and producing some of the cool sulfate compounds we're gonna talk about actually in a minute, some of the indoles. Um, and P9 is this really interesting protein that acromantia makes, right? That may actually, Tom, be involved in influencing or inhibiting some of the um, enzymes, the hepatic enzymes involved in cholesterol synthesis and fatty acid synthesis. And this may be one of the mechanisms that, um, you know, prompts it to shine in, in metabolic imbalances. Absolutely, yeah. So it's kind of a range of products. You mentioned the short chain fatty acids. We definitely know propionate in particular has some really beneficial effects on glucose homeostasis. Um, you can see there, if you kind of squint at the, the figure, there's this P9 and then also the AMUC 1100. Um, so there's all these different components. They're either part of its uh, wall that it produces as metabolic products, uh, such as the P9. Um, and again, we're discovering more and more about their direct effects on a whole range of aspects of metabolism, both locally in the gut, um, but then also elsewhere, especially liver, fat tissue, uh, even the gut brain axis. Yeah, even the gut brain axis, yeah. So again, this is just looking at, well, this is specifically, so this is, we're looking, we're, we're looking at acromantia today a little bit through the lens of longevity. And so this is a study just looking at uh, it ameliorating age-related decline in colonic mucus thickness. To that point, you know, as Fasano has famously said, all disease begins in the gut. I think most of us on this on this call are likely familiar with the the incredible Dr. Alessio Fasano, who characterized azonulin many years ago uh, and has identified its chief role in prompting gut permeability. Um, so all disease begins in the gut associated with intestinal permeability. Uh, you know, not surprisingly, of course, aging is, you know, one of the chief diseases we see, or I should say, some longevity folks, some biogerontologists are, are describing aging as a disease. Uh, I just said it. I don't know that I completely subscribe to that, but certainly we see the pathogenic mechanisms in the aging journey are similar to those we see in the chronic diseases of aging, um, all being connected to this loss of, 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 of barrier function. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. Acromancia, again, uh, this is, a, this is a free full text if you're interested in reading it. I think it's a great review talking about uh, the wonderment of this keystone strain, its involvement. So insufficient acromancia, uh, again, not just intestinal permeability, but we can track it to, we can pull the thread of insufficient acromancia and see it associated with ALS, with 
cancers. We can actually see improved response to immunotherapy, cancer immunotherapies, when there's sufficient acromantia present. Uh, autism, depression, Alzheimer's, arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, IBS, uh, and on and on and on. We do know, and I, and I suspect that, that this will be a comment in the chat, and Tom and I will be sure to talk about it, that high acromantia has been associated with MS, and we should circle back, we will circle back, and talk about our thoughts on that, but right now, I want to just cast the net around acromantia deficiency and the, uh, you know, the fallout and probably a cornerstone, a cornerstone piece, not probably, is this breakdown of the mucin barrier and the compromised uh, gut wall. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Tom? I see you over there nodding. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, on that slide that you showed previously where they talked about acromantia um, playing an important role. So we talked about how it's a mucin degrader. Um, I think it was actually maybe one before this, um, but it's certainly a mucin degrader. So when it's excessive, it's possible that um, acromantia, when it's too high, it might over degrade the mucus layer. But at the same time, all of these products that we talked about, the short chain fatty acids, some of the other products, help to stimulate adequate mucus production. And really interesting, one of the aspects that we haven't talked about yet as far as the gut barrier and the concept of gut healing goes beyond leaky gut. So we certainly know acromantia can promote um, normal intestinal um, sort of lack of, of permeability. Um, so it's very protective in that regard. But we all know actually, we kind of learn as sort of our basic gut physiology that the intestinal lining, the epithelial cells turn over completely. The entire epithelium turns over within mm -hmm. Uh, three to five days or so. Yeah. So that's really the core of gut healing uh, because you really need to have that process go properly. And then of course, when there's damage and inflammation that could be compromised um, without getting into too much detail, research also shows that acromantia plays a critical role in several aspects of that process. So it helps promote this normal regeneration process and it even influences the types of cells that can develop. So the epithelium isn't just one, one thing. It's not just the enterocytes or colonocytes. Of course, there's goblet cells that produce mucus, as an example. Um, exactly, right here. So you can see that basically, because of its close proximity, all these things that it can release, it has direct access to influencing the intestinal barrier and this whole regeneration process. So since regeneration decreases with aging, mucus decreases with aging, the idea is that uh, people that have higher levels, and I know you're going to um, get to this shortly, um, but people that have higher levels may have more successful aging. Yeah. You know, to your point, I just want to underscore. So, yes, recycling the mucin barrier, which, you know, as you said, turns over in, what, what's the time frame? One to three days? Complete turnover of the whole, actually, the whole barrier wall. Yeah, it's kind of on the order of three to five days. Mm -hmm. um, so stem cells, so it's going to be stimulating intest intestinal stem cells and in so doing increasing goblet cell production, PANF cells, I think, and then the, and then the sort of the workhorse enterocytes. Exactly. That, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's really pretty extraordinary. Okay. Let's jump back to uh, where we were. Um, so yeah, when we look at healthy centenarians, people who are aging well, um, they have a diverse microbiome and it's you know populated with a robust amount of acromantia. Uh, undoubtedly, if we were to measure zonulin in, in centenarians, I don't know if there's any data out on that. You would you would know better than I, Tom. You know, probably yeah. their zonula is low and you know they've got they've got an intact barrier. Yeah, in general, certainly intestinal permeability tends to increase with age, but for people that age successfully, like centenarians, that tends to be uh, reduced for sure. So clearly, it's not rocket science to deduce that we want to be focusing on our gut in the aging journey, that it needs to be a key player. Likely, everybody's familiar with the hallmarks of aging. Uh, this is this was this is an updated hallmarks of aging paper. This is a great great paper. Very interesting if you can get your hands on it. Unfortunately, it's not a a free full text, but this was just published in Cell in 2023, so this year in January. Uh, 
they have expanded what is included in the hallmarks of aging to now include dysbiosis. So aging is driven by hallmarks fulfilling these three pieces. Uh, they manifest in age. So these hallmarks manifest on the aging journey, inflammation, genomic instability, telomere attrition, epigenetic alterations, dysbiosis, loss of uh, proteostasis, mitochondrial dysfunction, et cetera. You can go around the circle and look at the various hallmarks of aging. Uh, they kick in in the aging journey. Uh, there, it, we can accelerate aging in experimental models. So in a mouse model, if you kick in dysbiosis uh, or if you kick in chronic inflammation, you can manipulate these in an experimental model and you will see aging be accelerated. Uh, and it, it exists if we can change these, if we can improve or reverse these hallmarks of aging, then the opportunity to actually stop or reverse aging itself then comes into play. So in this 2023 cell paper, the authors have updated it to include dysbiosis, chronic inflammation, uh, and macro autophagy. Um, I want to I just that middle bullet uh, point out that these hallmarks are very much you know logically interconnected. Um, so dysbiosis, going in and addressing the gut. I mean, this is validating to us who, you know, kind of grew up in, in integrative medicine, start with the gut. You know, anybody going through their functional medicine training or practicing as a, a functional medicine provider, we, we can get far with most of our patients presenting to us with chronic disease if we start in the gut. You know, when in doubt, people say sometimes start in the gut or, you know, also you can take a great history and be a really seasoned functional medicine provider and still of course, you're starting in the gut. So I think it's a, a wise addition, dysbiosis and chronic inflammation um, uh, and macro autophagy actually have all been added. And I just, before we flip over to the next slide, I wanna ask you, Tom, if you have any thoughts on it. Yeah, I think it's actually almost overdue <laughs> based yeah. on the volume of information that's been coming out, uh, particularly with dysbiosis and inflammation. And we just certainly know there's some interactions there. We're gonna be talking about that as well, kind of throughout the webinar, but um, we certainly know that dysbiosis can be one of the contributors to inflammation, for example. Um, and to your point, I think that's really one of the most important points about the fact that they're interconnected and how do they influence one another. And you can't really just focus on one thing. You really have to look at the big picture and figure out, you know, for an individual personalized medicine, what is it for that person that seems to be most compromised? And it, often it's the microbiome. Yeah, so we cast this wide net. We do need to be working and thinking about all the hallmarks, but when we enter into addressing a single hallmark, we will influence by extension the others. One of the best ways we influence chronic inflammation is again through addressing dysbiosis. So there's many ways that we can enter into this really powerful conversation. And to your point, it's high time that dysbiosis was in there. Um, because yeah, there's plenty of evidence out there. And the converse is true, you know, as we just pointed out. Um, healthy, long-lived individuals have healthy guts. This is from the Hallmark, so I just pulled out the table from this particular paper on dysbiosis. I wanted to point out that, you know, acromancia is featured here. So all of them, all of my arrows, these are these are mouse studies, and then the bottom one was in uh, was in humans, and that was an oral administration of acromancia uh, demonstrating improved metabolic parameters in obese and diabetic patients. Um, you know, classically obesity, uh, diabetes, both, you know, clear uh, imbalances in, in the aging journey. Uh, the rest of these are animal studies, but we can see that uh, either directly acromancia is making a difference here or products that acromancia is capable of producing, including these indole metabolites, which we're going to talk about. And Tom and I actually have a good podcast on where he goes into some depth on them. Short chain fatty acids also. All of the these are 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 produced or the production of them is supported by acromancia. Probably if we looked at some of these FMT studies, we would see an influence on acromancia. And the and I also want to say that acromancia doesn't work in a vacuum. There's a whole eco niche of 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 players that are uh, you know, favorably influencing gut health, uh, acromancia is one of them. Any comments on this, Tom? Yeah, and I'm sure we're going to get to talking more about that when we get into the highs and lows and treatment options, but um, that is so important to consider when you're assessing it. 
uh, is how all these different factors can influence it, um, including just the other microbes. So I think when we get to talking about testing options, um, it's important to look at the big picture and not really just focus exclusively on any one particular marker. Um, as always, we're kind of zooming out and looking at what is the big picture telling us. Um, and it kind of can give you some clues if you have a lack of acromancia. Uh, what are some of those upstream root causes that might be contributing to it? So to zoom upstream, I love that there's a lot of ways that we can approach uh, you know, nourishing our intestinal microbiome, including increasing acromancia. Uh, but again, it's not in a vacuum. We're going to talk about ways that we can do what we can favorably influence the overall microbiome, but you know, we are shining a light specifically today on acromancia. Um, certainly polyphenols are big, but we're going to talk about some other other ways that we can favorably tweak it. There's a lot of really cool research out there on the wonderment of polyphenols. Um, cranberry, uh, pomegranate, uh, both shown to considerably bump up acromancia, and they're you know and they're and they're and they're influencing that whole ecosystem, that whole eco niche, if you will. So uh, not just acromancia. Um, you know, a cool study that I read recently looking specifically at pomegranate in those. So pomegranate has a legic acid uh, people are probably familiar with. It's one of the polyphenols in pomegranate that um, is thought to work its magic it, um, on, you know, on us, exert that really beneficial effect of, of, of pomegranate. But a legic acid has to be activated by our microbiome into something called urolithin A. And so this cool study that I read recently demonstrated that individuals who have the microbiome to produce urolithin A responded to pomegranate. So their acromancia increased, I think, 47 fold greater than the non urolithin A producers in response to pomegranate. So for some of us, pomegranate is going to be a sweet spot producer. To your point, Tom, having access to labs, being able to actually characterize C see the abundance of acromancy in our gut can kind of give us the sweet spot combination or our patients, you know, the polyphenol combination that's going to work best for them. So in this study, you know, pomegranate's definitely it for some people. We can measure uh, urolithin A and, you know, I produce some, I don't produce a huge amount, but that's nice to see that alegic acid would be an appropriate polyphenol for me. But I do think uh, a, a, a good broad intake of many different types of polyphenols can, you know, influence not just the acromancia growth, you know, but the other, the other players working intimately with acromancia. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I would just underscore that, that the diversity is so important and having a range of different polyphenols. Uh, we know that the way they're broken down because they're kind of complex structures, you can kind of see an example here. Um, each microbe that can break these down has kind of difference, differences in their ability to do this. Um, so this is kind of these little micro niches in the gut. Um, and that's really where you need a range of, of polyphenols to feed different types of microbes that can break down different types. And then you get the full benefit from the polyphenols. I also want to point out the final bullet because that's another cool study on that on that previous slide, just showing that acromancia can be taken as a as a probiotic, and you know we can see benefit we can see benefit in human and in animal studies on obesity related metabolic disturbances and and in this particular mouse study in the mucosal barrier. So pomegranates, uh, excuse me, polyphenols to indirectly stimulate production, but then actually using the probiotic itself uh, has certainly been shown benefit. This is another study, you know, again, using a polyphenol rich dietary pattern. This is the maple, the maple randomized, it was a randomized crossover control study it, or trial um, on older adults, an eight week polyphenol dense intervention. This intervention included again, pomegranate, it included green tea, chocolate, apples, uh, oranges. And so they, they they, they just changed out three servings uh, through the day with a polyphenol-rich alternative, and then the control group didn't receive those changes. So they weren't overwhelmed with polyphenols, but it was, you know, it was definitely greater than the control. And then they had an eight-week washout, and then they crossed and, you know, switched diets. Um, 
So this combination improved intestinal permeability, improved barrier, uh, as evidenced by a drop in serum zonulin in these individuals. And there's been a lot of publications based on this maple randomized control trial. And if you're interested in really kind of getting in the nitty gritty with this, I recommend pulling them up. Most of them are free full texts, but we can see that this polyphenol rich pattern just increased those all important gut bugs in the mucin layer associated with uh, a healthy uh, intestinal microbiome and in so doing improved intestinal permeability as measured by a drop in zonulin and an increase in fiber fermenting uh, good guys um, in the gut microbiome. Comments on that, Tom? Well, this is actually a new study to me, so this is a very interesting. I'll have to check out the reference here, but um, yeah. not surprising on the one hand based on what we know, but uh, just yet another demonstration of just how powerful this can be. Uh, just looking at the results there on the lower left, uh, even effects on blood pressure, um, yes. and then additional effects on promoting these butyrate producing bacteria. So um, again, I can't, I think, I know you're a big proponent of polyphenols and I can't uh, underscore that enough either, that I think it, they're just so, such an important part of the diet that they're, they're really as essential as fiber. We always think of fiber and probiotics as kind of the go-tos, but uh, polyphenols really, I think are, maybe kind of better recognized now, but I think they're still kind of up and coming as far as recognizing their importance. Well, for many years, they were the so-called dark matter of nutrition. And of course, we still haven't characterized most of what we're eating, you know, on a well, a fork full of a well-designed salad, you know, the bulk of those compounds were, you know, we're still figuring out, let alone their complex interactions and the interactions on the microbiome and on systemic health. You know, to your point, this did influence systemic health. And this was only an eight week intervention, everybody, eight weeks. <laughs> and it's it wasn't an overwhelming protocol, just three increase, you know, increases of, of polyphenol exposure, you know, per day. In eight weeks, they dropped zonulin levels and they had uh, systemic you know, improvement in hypertension and so forth. I mean, it's, it just imagine transitioning as we are doing in our practice all the time, people onto just a general polyphenol rich diet. It's, it's really cool, it's pretty extraordinary. And Tom, actually, so for our next conversation, the maple trial, they're just publishing all sorts of stuff. They're looking at metabolomics and they're just looking at all sorts of really interesting um, secondary activities from that polyphenol, that baseline polyphenol intervention. So again, you know, th this is from the, the maple trial. They looked at these indoles and there's, you know, there's a host of indoles. You're gonna talk about it in a second. We, it, the indoles are produced from tryptophan. So this is where protein comes into play. You can't have a healthy gut without giving them some protein and, and, and tryptophan in particular, uh, is essential for producing these indoles. There is incidentally bad guy indoles, uh, indole, like indokin, which is indoxyl sulfate. You know, indokin is an old school marker in functional medicine. I mean, back in the day, we remember the first clinic that I shadowed before I went to medical school, the, um, the naturopathic doctor there, Eugene Zamperone, would do a little in-house sort of color test on a, on a urine specimen to see if there were, indo, there, there were there, indoxyl sulfate, aka indican, was present. And that was a really an old school diagnosis for dysbiosis. So that's a, that's a tryptophan derived indole that's, in, that, that's produced by um, problem uh, bacteria, an indic of a, of, a, of a dysbiotic gut. But then there's this rich abundance of these uh, indoles that are associated with longevity, like IPA or indole 3 propionic acid, uh, extended lifespan in animal models, healthy aging in humans, et cetera. Um, and a polyphenol rich diet, looking again at that pomegranate, you know, green tea, chocolate, you know, maple trial intervention, increased indole 3 propionic acid in older adults. And, you know, the slide after this, and then I want to stop and listen to what you have to say, Tom, is that, um, we can see that acromancia produces indole 3 propionic acid, but that indole 3 propionic acid, this is where it gets really cool, actually increases acromancia. There's like this feed forward, this favorable feed forward loop. And in and, and the polyphenols can drive both of them. So I don't know, as somebody said to me recently, you know, we're going to need to employ 
AI technology to kind of really weed out some of these extraordinarily complex interactions, but it's it's very cool to me. So indole 3 propionic acid, um, important player in a healthy microbiome. And then what do you want to add to that? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I can't underscore that enough. I know we're going to talk about indoles a little bit more, <clears throat> so I don't want to preempt that too much. But just with the IPA itself, um, there's really some interesting studies that have been coming out the last few years, including this one. Um, and also, it's a key uh, product produced by the microbiome that promotes that gut-brain axis health. I know that's in there here. I think it's one of the bullet points down, further cognitive performance. Um, yes. So again, this is just another great example of of how health of the gut and the gut microbiome and these specific products have these specific effects throughout the whole body. And when we're thinking about you know, our own lives, our families, the patients sitting in front of us. So we've got a lot of tools, you know, so we can lean on our polyphenols. We can lean on adequate protein. There's a diverse, you know, a diverse group of polyphenols, although there's some emphasis on on, on pomegranate, especially uh, for acromantia. And then we can use uh, probiotics when indicated as well. All right, this is the... Um, the interesting study showing that feed forward phenomena. So tryptophan can help with tryptophan, so enough protein, uh, or specifically tryptophan, the amino acid, you know, in the presence of a good gut microbiome, including acromantia, can produce these beautiful longevity associated indoles. Uh, and then the indoles themselves can kind of feed forward and stimulate production of the um, of acromantia itself. So this is a this is an in vitro study, but I just thought it was cool enough to share, and I like the I like the graphic. Yeah, and I like the so it depicts some of those indoles and the other um, kind of in the center there. Um, so just kind of a quick side note about these other indoles. So IPA is probably one of the most famous ones uh, that's been studied for a while now, um, but there's a whole range of them, um, and a lot of them come directly from tryptophan and the actions of acromancy and other microbes on them. Uh, but also, I also want to emphasize that cruciferous vegetables are a key mm -hmm. source of these indoles as well. So getting enough of those in your diet can be very important as kind of a complement to make sure that you're getting enough of these uh, indole compounds, which, um, and you're probably be talking about this as well, but that newer category of uh, kind of looking at microbiome promoting Got promoting supplements is the postbiotics. Uh, so those are the products produced by the microbiome. And so indoles really overall um, are an up and coming category of postbiotics. And we're going to see a lot of activity in that area in the near future. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Um, so you're hearing it here. <laughs> you know, some of our interventions that we can do now uh, to look at these and that that old school indicin marker that you've been looking at for years, if you're doing an organic acid panel, uh, you know, is uh, an indole, but it's it's an indole that's associated with um, pathology. In fact, it's been associated with 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 Parkinson disease, for example, and other uh, central nervous system neurodegenerative conditions, but Parkinson in particular is something I was reading about recently. So, you know, we want to pay attention to the bad actor indoles, which, you know, I think we are, and we're probably more versed on than some of these really good essential players. But, you know, as Tom said, more to come. However, we've got the tools now to support production. This is moving into one of the reasons I love this conversation, the interaction of polyphenols, of our nutrients, of protein, uh, bacterial action on said polyphenols, and then those uh, metabolites that we've been talking about influencing the epigenome. So if anybody's been paying attention to my work for the last few years, I've of course been publishing on uh, and, and will continue to uh, looking looking at how a diet and lifestyle intervention can influence our own gene expression. Uh, likely, a big reason the diet uh, the dietary intervention that we used in our study uh, had a favorable influence on DNA methylation is because. Uh, we were supporting a robust microbiome and all of those secondary metabolites that can then go in and favorably talk to our genes. Um, turning on good genes, you know, and inhibiting bad genes. And I, I know I'm 
I'm grossly oversimplifying it. Um, and there is insufficient research in humans. I mean, when I you know wrote our when I wrote the book uh, Younger You, um, a lot of the actions that I was citing were animals and in vitro. Uh, but I'm just really excited to be contributing to the body of human uh, data that we have on these. Um, on the on um, you know on the on the gene expression impact on the epigenetic impact of these um, really important compounds. Any comment on that, Tom? Yeah, and I think this is just an amazing demonstration of the power of these types of compounds, and especially when you sort of consider that interaction with the microbiome and your benefit or your effect for each individual is going to depend in large part not just on what you're consuming but also on your microbiome as well. So those two components together um, can yield a lot of different uh, products, for example, that can then influence methylation and other, other aspects of um, yeah. this whole process. And I noticed kind of in the middle there, there's um, the HAT enzyme. You see those little AC? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's acetylation. And yeah. then the N on the other side are methylation. So acetylation, Let's make a quick comment about that because there's also a lot of research now on the microbiome, not just in methylation and factors that it produces that can influence that, uh, but also acetylation. So, uh, for example, butyrate itself um, is one of the factors that can influence that process uh, for uh, acetylation and its effects on uh, gene expression. So, again, it's, I just think it's so interesting that you know, these dietary components have such a powerful effect on how our genes are, are influencing our health. You know, one of the cool things that we saw, so we didn't measure the microbiome in the, you know, our first two publications. We haven't measured the microbiome. It would be, it would be great uh, to look at it and to see what characters were increasing, what ones were dropping. I would obviously anticipate that we would see increased production of acromantia um, because we're feeding such a we're, you know, the diet is so ac pro acromantia, but we did increase. So the, the a, a healthy gut microbiome makes a multivitamin. You know, it's really that simple. And we did increase in our in our intervention without using B vitamins. We increased circulating methylfolate significantly as compared to our control group. Um, That's amazing. Yeah, it is. Yeah, without without it's. I mean, it's just it's an attest. It's a testament to you know the the power of a healthy microbiome and a whole foods diet. And, you know, this is how we evolved. We evolved our microbiome, us humans, our microbiome, our diet, like we, we, we evolved interconnected in this very symbiotic relationship. And I think when we move our dietary patterns back to something like this, you know, then we really open up the opportunity to do some of to see these things that are extraordinary to us now, but they're only extraordinary to us because we moved so far away from them, you know, in this standard American uh, approach to eating. We're quantifying, this is, the, this is the dietary pattern that we used in our study, the basics of it. Um, we're quantifying the polyphenols now, so stay tuned, stay tuned for that. That's something that, um, you know, that I hope to include in the next publication, just an, an estimate. There's variety in the diet. People have some choice options. So polyphenols will vary from individual to individual, but we used a, a polyphenol dense greens powder and people were need to consume seven to nine cups of, of veggies, including to your point, uh, cruciferous, uh, lots of greens, colorful veg, you know, as well as some of the all important berries and so forth. Chocolate's allowed on it, <laughs> you know, chocolate in the maple trial was probably one of the, you know, beneficial pieces. Coffee, coffee's legal on this. <laughs> Again, it's another really important compound with some good phytochemicals in it that, you know, can favorably regulate gene expression. This is, this is our first study. This is the, um, the, the randomized uh, pilot clinical trial where we were able to show that we reduced biological age by over three years in our study participants, um, as measured by looking at DNA methylation, but specifically the Horvath clock. We didn't see a net increase in methylation, so we did increase the possibility, we increased circulating folate, but what we saw, which I think is actually so cool, is a rearrangement of how methylation was happening on the epigenome to something more favorable, more healthful. So that 
that's our first publication. We're now back into this. So we the, we, we, we looked at the, the uh, we used something called the EPIC array, which has almost a million methylation sites on the, on the entire array. And we were only looking at the Horvath clock, which is 353. So we looked at a very small fraction of the methylome in this first study. We are now expanding that and looking more broadly at how nutrients influenced um, influence the methylome. And that will be our, our next publication along, you know, I want to quantify the polyphenols in that as well. Any comments on that, Tom? Um, I know when I first heard about this, I was pretty amazed because I know there's all this uh, investment happening in the biotech field to look for ways to reverse aging. And the simple tools that we have in functional medicine uh, really can take us a, a fair amount of the way there. And I think this is really the first demonstration that that can happen. And these methylation clocks by now are pretty well validated as actually reflecting the rate of aging. So uh, yes. I think very robust, um, and I know you have some additional exciting data you're going to be uh, promoting as well. Um, but I just I think this is really remarkable. I mean, this people do need to see data. They need, you know we we all know these things are good for us to some extent, but uh, to see the actual the, the data based on these well validated measures, I think is just it's just amazing. I'm very impressed with this. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, and thanks for your support, actually, along the way. You know, I want to say that just to go back to that that Hallmarks of Aging paper, I pointed out, I didn't sort of, I didn't land on it for any length of time, but epigenetic, there's a, there's a very clear breakdown in at gene expression, and we can measure that very carefully with looking at DNA methylation, one of the key methyl, uh, epigenetic marks. Um, and as you said, we can look at it so reliably that it can predict biological aging. I mean, the clocks are really becoming rig more and more rigorous. I mean, they're very important. But really interesting for me is that these clocks are not just surrogate markers of the aging phenomena. These clocks may be actually picking up aging. So they're not just suggesting this person's aging fast, but the imbalance that's happening, this predictable pattern of negative changes that happens in the epigenome may actually be suggestive of the aging process. And there's research out in animal models and cell studies where we, when we reverse that predictable pattern that happens on the aging journey, we reverse disease. And in fact, we can actually reverse aging as itself, as, as Sinclair has has shown in his team at Harvard. Um, they've shown it in an animal um, optic neuropathy model. They've shown it in skin cells that we can really turn back the hands of time by favorably aug augmenting um, the epigenome and specifically DNA methylation. So it's, it's exciting, it's heady stuff. And we can also see that perhaps in our intervention, one of the ways that, that we were you know, most potently influencing the methylome was through the gut. And this is a study that we just published in March. This came out in March this year. And this was a this is a case a case series of women. So our first study was in men, and we were excited to put this this case series out in women, showing um, actually they got they responded even even better to the intervention. Although it, the reality is we used blood in these guys. We used saliva in the original study, and the and the clocks were just slightly different. It's very sensitive, so. You know, when you when when it's when it's changed ever so slightly, the the data can change as well. So it's not quite an apples to apples comparison, but we can say that the ladies did better. <laughs> I want to move through this section on metabolic health. You know, just quickly, acromancia I think is it for human data. Um, you know, impressive and exciting is the fact that people who have good amounts of acromancia are less likely to be obese. You know, significantly so. Um, and that supplementing with acromancia can actually improve markers of metabolic uh, imbalance. And so this, this is coming from the American Gut Project. This is a massive data set of over 10,000 participants. And if you look at that second bullet, 10% um, higher acromancia would reduce the risk for obesity by about 26% on average. That's, that's pretty cool, pretty impressive. And then this is looking uh, acromance, in acromancia and improved metabolic health in individual in obese individuals. Acromancia is inversely related to fasting glucose, waist hip ratio, and subcutane, subcutaneous adipocyte diameter. Um, 
so we can see clear imbalance in acromantia and uh, metabolic disease. And when we use acromantia, and again, this is not a long trial. This was a 12-week trial, uh, a five-strain probiotic formulation, including acromantia, lowered postprandial glucose spikes by 33%, lowered A1C by 0.6%. Um, and it was safe and well tolerated. I have certainly seen an acromantia combination probiotic in my practice. I've used it a lot um, in, in myself. Uh, personally, have experienced changes to postprandial glucose spikes um, as measured by my own little N of one continuous glucose monitor um, use. But yeah, I, I'm bullish on the possibility of these probiotic combinations. Any comments there, Tom? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say that um, the research on the role of acromancy in promoting metabolic health is probably uh, the longest and kind of the best supported of all these studies on its health effects. There's such a robust amount of research supporting its beneficial effects uh, on metabolic health. And that's everything from, as you mentioned, obesity, weight management, effects on uh, fat cells, effects on liver, um, even locally in the gut itself. Some of those products can promote some of those key, uh, fairly newly recognized hormones, like one called GLP-1, for yes. example. Um, also promotes another one called PYY that promotes satiety. Um, so there's just all these different levels in which it can uh, kind of in total promote metabolic health. And that, again, is very well researched, very well supported by the evidence. And it makes sense then that it would be a player in longevity because, of course, you know, metabolic imbalance is a, is, is a hallmark of the aging journey and something that we see, you know, increase, you know, in everybody, you know, metabolic fragility or inflexibility is, 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 right. is common in the aging journey. And I just want to circle back to that, you know, one of the earlier slides where I talked about all of the diseases associated with insufficient acromantia. I, I'm pretty excited to see you know, where we go, you know, and more human clinical data, for instance, in inflammatory bowel disease, or, I mean, we know in people who are adhering to strict FODMAP uh, diet that they'll drop their acromantia, they'll, they'll basically fast their microbiome. And for, if we, if, if we prescribe a FODMAP for too long, we will usher in uh, bacterial and microbiome imbalance. So we need to be mindful of that. But, you know, I think it, it'll be exciting, you know, to see where we go in this, in this research. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So we've already talked a lot about synergistic effects with acromantia and that whole eco niche in the mucin layer and all of the beautiful compounds that they're producing. This combination, acromantia, um, mucinophilia, and clostridium butyricum is one that I've used in practice, that I use in practice. And to Tom's point, uh, frequently use it in people with uh, diabetes or who are falling somewhere on the metabolic continuum work with it in my patients with obesity um, where I'm thinking about support for GL, GLP-1. Um, you know, everybody's using semiglutide or talking about semiglutide. There are people who can't handle, uh, you know, semiglutide, which is a GLP-1 agonist. And so we need to be digging into our functional toolkit for ways that we can, you know, increase uh, endogenous production of GLP-1 and you know, there's there's no doubt in my mind with with and with you know my own experience that you know this combination is key. Uh, but we're also we also want to go back to our polyphenols and adequate protein and you know a keto diet. Um, in fact, there's a cool study, just a sidebar, looking at keto diet in ep epilepsy in an animal model. The thinking is that it was favorably influencing acromantia. And that was driving the beneficial effect of the keto diet. When they shut down acromantia with an antimicrobial, the benefits of the ketogenic diet were lost. Have you seen that study, Virginia? I have. Yeah, that's pretty remarkable. And it's kind of in line with also the studies on fasting as well that can increase yes. acromantia. And then some of the beneficial effects from fasting are likely due to uh, increased acromantia as well. It's interesting to me, but if you tweak the diet, with a with with a FODMAP intervention, we have to use a FODMAP intervention short term. You know, I do it all the time. But if you do it for too long, you can actually harm acromantia. Yeah, yeah. I think um, certainly that whole idea of, of fermentable carbs and promoting 
the short chain fatty acids, you certainly need to have sources. Um, these days I know there are ways to kind of tweak and sort of limit the FODMAP approach so you can yes. hone in on maybe the specific FODMAPs that are a problem yes. and still then focus on other types of fiber sources so that your microbiome is still overall healthy. Yeah, in my practice we try to do actually a quick FODMAP challenge, you know, so to your point, you know, you don't have to eliminate anything for a long time. That it's it's quick, and then you can figure out what key food maps need to be removed. You know, for a longer period. This is a quick case. There's a lot of there are a lot of words here. I'm going to try to move through it pretty quickly so we can get to the take home of it. But um, this is a longtime patient of mine. Interesting. She has um, she's obese, and it's a drug induced obesity. So. Um, but she's also had a lifetime incredibly difficult gut, which I'm absolutely sure has played a role in, uh, you know, in her health outcomes. So she had lactose intolerance onset in childhood that was misdiagnosed as an anxious stomach. So you can just imagine spending decades being told you have an anxious stomach, <laughs> you know, just that alone, the psychological damage. So continued to consume dairy because they didn't identify it as being an issue until, until she was well into adulthood. Um, so she, not surprisingly, she was under rate, weight. She had, you know, a mild malnutrition. I'm sure that her microbiome, with this experience, was really damaged from the get-go. Um, and she sustained significant physical and verbal abuse. Um, in adulthood, she was diagnosed with complex PTSD, uh, and she was started on, you know, kind of a revolving door of different medications uh, to attempt to control that. Uh, not surprising, as so many people do, who are on these um, psychotropic meds, they gain weight, you know, and they just move along, they gallop along the metabolic continuum, and she was no exception. A big, you know, well-identified problem player is Abilify. Um, so she went from being very underweight and thin through most of her early years to be becoming obese um, and really having a difficult time losing weight. She was a non-responder, interestingly, to semiglutide, not because of the GI side effects that commonly, you know, inhibit people from being able to stay. She was a non-responder because I think that there are, you know, there's a population who can override satiety cues. So uh, the, the PTSD, her anxiety, her panic, her depression sort of overrode her ability to actually feel full you know, that the, that the GLP-1 agonists can create. So she was a non-responder. Uh, another trauma, severe trauma to her gut was, um, you know, she was, she was put on antibiotics for respiratory illness and she promptly developed uh, C. diff colitis. And she was supposed to get FMT. She was on an FMT uh, waiting list, but, you know, COVID kicked in and that was that. Thank God her, her physician at that time in 2020 prescribed uh, Sackville already, and she did respond to vancomycin, uh, so she was, you know, she was able to get off that ledge, but still, just gut disruption after gut disruption. She didn't connect the gut-brain uh, access like I did, but it was clear to me, just given her history of this gut challenges, that it had to be playing a role in her PTSD. My immediate prescription to her was the combination Acromancia probiotic. Um, the Acromancia and the Clostridia buterecum probiotic for sure. Um, primarily, I was thinking about the her her weight issue and you know and some of her metabolic imbalances, which are only mild. But that was my primary my primary thought. Actually, there was more than that. I knew her gut was damaged over a lifetime. Intestinal permeability was likely. I wasn't able to do a lot of functional testing. Budget is an issue. And I and the probiotic trumped for me laboratory data, but we will get laboratory data now. I think it's a, I think it's essential to her case, but you know, we can only pay for so much. So I opted for the intervention because my suspicion that acromancia was imbalanced in her was very, very strong. Uh, and along with all of the associated players. So we started her on that co combo probiotic about eight months ago. Um, she maintains a generally healthy diet. Sometimes we do harm reduction choices, so uh, it's not a perfect diet. She's not following, you know, our younger you perfectly. But for example, if she goes to McDonald's, she can take the bread off the, the burger. You know, those harm reduction choices. So she's uh, she's doing that. She's getting some veg, etc. Um, 
the cool very first thing that she noted that was a surprise for me, I, I was aware of the data but hadn't seen it uh, spelled out to the extent that her experience did, was um, a drop in anxiety and an ability, she was, she was able to discontinue Abilify and she says that she thinks it's associated with the onset of this probiotic. Um, in dropping the Abilify, she was able to start losing weight and maybe being a little bit more sensitive to satiety cues because her overall anxiety and depression has lessened. She's since been able to do a deeper type of psychotherapy specifically related to complex PTSD um, and taken all together she's feeling better and she's finally starting to lose weight. So this is somebody who would lose weight, gain it back, gain a few times more, lose a little, you know, and on and on and on over many, many, many years, a really challenging case. And our focus has been, um, or my work with her has been on gut health and the role that gut health plays. So it's been a cool case. It's just a, it's an N of one, but I think that, um, you know, she's experiencing for the first time in her life, she's 57 now, she's experiencing some really favorable changes and I just, I couldn't be happier. And she's happy about it too. Any thoughts on that, Tom? Certainly, I think it's a great demonstration of that whole gut-brain connection. And once again, the role of acromancia, um, that's just a growing area of research, more and more studies coming out on role of acromancia in mood disorders, et cetera. Um, and I think, it also illustrates that once you kind of get some of those initial hurdles removed, so if her anxiety is sort of part of the, the issue, it's one of these vicious cycles, if you're able to kind of take that down a couple notches with um, probiotic supplementation with acromancy, et cetera, then that enables some of these other steps to start happening. So yeah. I just think it's a great example for a lot of different reasons, but uh, those and, are kind and, of out. And as you and I have talked about earlier, we know acromancia can 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 support the increased production of um, serotonin. And, and as I mentioned in the beginning of this talk, low acromancia is identified in depression. And finally, the other really cool clinical pearl is that acromancia appears to be an epic producer of GABA. And maybe that's one of the reasons why it works in in epilepsy and a keto induced epilepsy. And, and you need it there for a the keto diet to be effective in that population. And maybe that's why it was helpful for her. So these are questions that definitely, uh, you know, remain to be answered, but acromancia plays, plays a role there. Um, low acromancia, I'm just gonna cut to the chase. You know, we've talked about the implications of it, I think, already. We know that we, we know how we can increase it. We can think about polyphenols. We want we want to get some tryptophan in there. Um, we can supplement with acromancia. Um, there's we can test uh, for for low acromancia. I mean it's I think it's pretty straightforward and I think it's a no brainer um, that we have interventions that can support increasing it. Um, it's the high acromancia that has been questions for a question on many folks minds i want to say that um my thinking was strongly that maybe it was a maybe it was evidence for another process happening say if the barrier is so de deteriorated maybe that mucin uh is sloughing off into the fecal bolus and then when you test you actually see an elevation of acromancia whereas if you biopsied you know in, if you actually took a specimen of the of the mucin directly, you know you might see that there's insufficient acromancia in the mucin outer layer, or maybe you would even see a problem, you know, and scant mucin barrier. So my thinking has been maybe it's secondary a high acromancia, not so much to a true acromancia elevation, but to another pathological process happening. So that's one thought. But I will say the second thought is, you know. With MS, there's some concern that high acromancia may be a piece of the problem. I don't think that they've teased it out, but there's, I will say that uh, high acromancia, I would still use the intervention. I would still use the probiotic in people needing GLP-1 support, people on the metabolic continuum, people who I think have barrier permeability, et cetera, et cetera, the other conditions that we've talked about today. I may uh, 
pause on that and you lean on our lean on our whole food polyphenol intervention and some of the other things we've talked about with um, individuals who have MS. So that's my that's my current thinking on um, you know high acromancy. It's it, it isn't necessarily going to stop me from using the probiotic. Actually, it's not. And there's a couple caveats. What are your thoughts, Tom? That's a that's kind of a great question. So there is overall less research on high um, what it means, what are the impacts, there's associations. I think as we all know, associations don't necessarily mean causation. There could be um, sort of related reasons why it's elevated. As you mentioned, it might be a compensatory increase. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly, you know, we know if the overall gut microbiome is not as healthy, you have less um, of the competitors present, then it's possible that acromancia sort of increases to compensate for those competitors. Um, so I think you know, there's a lot of ways to look at that. Uh, we do need to see more research. Uh, some of the things that we do know for sure is, and it's not really discussed much, is antibiotics. So antibiotics, yes. we think of as sort of generally you know, kind of decimating the microbiome, lowering the microbiome, and that is true in, for many antibiotics. Um, but studies specifically on acromantia show that it varies depending on the probiotic. And some probiotics actually cause, or some antibiotics, I should say, actually cause a bloom in acromantia. So that's kind of a secondary reason there. It's just, again, maybe it's com uh, compensating for the lack of some of the other microbes. Um, and we also know from a healing standpoint, so we did get too much into this. We talked a little bit about the intestinal barrier regeneration. But uh, when there's actual damage happening to the mucosa, acromancy is uh, recognized as one of the, quote, wound healing pro-regenerative microbes that increases uh, to basically step in and help promote that regenerative process. So um, I think it's going to be context dependent. We see it a lot yes. of patients that are not digesting well. And there is evidence that higher sugars, so if you're not digesting well, you might get an influx of carbs and sugars in the, the colon that shouldn't be there. Um, but we know that some studies show that higher sugar diet also can promote elevated acromancia. And again, whether that's a problem or not is not entirely clear. I think you and I both absolutely would agree that if you see higher acromancia, you should not be pulling out your prescription pad or your botanical arsenal to kill it. Like that would not be a sophisticated and worthwhile approach by any stretch and the fallout wouldn't be worth it. We've got, we can nuance, we can look more sophisticated um, at digestion, as you say, um, you know, as at the other uh, microbes present at fatty acids, we can look at diet. I mean, there's so many, we can look at, you know, intestinal health, et cetera. There's so many other ways that we can sweet talk, we can engage in exercise, meditation. I mean, you know, there's far reaching interventions we have to balance our gut. Absolutely, yeah, and I think paying attention to those imbalances, um, again, it's not always, whatever you see elevated sometimes is part of the problem. Um, other times it's just a sign of imbalances. We see that a lot actually with certain opportunists and even certain pathogens that aren't always causing disease, but they're still telling you that something's wrong with the ecosystem. Let me just go ahead and flip through. We've got another, we've got another cool slide. We're going to give you some handouts. Um, okay, so that this is, these are some of the fabulous polyphenols that have evidence behind them for supporting increased production of acromancia. In, incidentally, omega-3 fatty acids can also influence production, <laughs> which I just think is is so cool. So a good solid whole foods diet. And then let me see, we've got a few thoughts on what if you're high on acromancia. I think specifically the most data are in uh, are in MS, but but to Tom's point, we really they're associative. Yeah. And more broadly looking at intestinal health overall, I think is is where it's at when we see high acromancia. I want to thank everybody so much for for joining us, for staying. It was really fun. Always great to hang out with you, Tom. I hope we get to do it again soon. Likewise, my pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald and Dr. Fabian. That does cover our time for today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, doctors. Have a Thank good you, day. Bye. <laughs>